Hello, welcome back to Organist Launchpad. I'm Isabel Demers, and we'll be talking today about manual technique. I think the first thing to, to talk about would be the hand position. And uh, when I was a kid, I was taught that you should look like you had an apple or a big bubble within your hand. And so that would be a little bit like this. That's a, that's a fairly big apple, maybe like a Texas-sized apple. Um, so uh, th this is good, of course, but um, it creates a little bit of tension. And, and sometimes you know, you'll see people playing and their hand is so curved uh, that their knuckles will turn white. So I like to think more of a basketball because a basketball is a bigger size and your hand is a little bit more stretched out. So you still have that shape you know, with the bridge being higher and, and your knuckles here not breaking, but uh, it's not quite as claw-like uh, as if you, you uh, closed more and thought of an apple. Whenever you play, obviously you really do not want to have any of those, uh, I guess, broken fingers, right? So you wanna make sure that those knuckles uh, will stay nice and steady and not break. Sometimes you see people playing and, and they look a little bit like this with their knuckles breaking and that obviously is not good. Uh, as in pedal technique, relaxation is really, really crucial. Um, Relaxation and minimum motion, I guess, would be the two, the two main factor that wh whatever you do, if you can just keep those two general rules in mind, it, it, really, uh, it really helps with the technique in general. You really do not want to get out of position too much. Um, and sometimes I think like you see people playing and they'll do just a lot of, of motions with their elbows um, and with their upper body in general and their wrists. Uh, and I think we're, we're taught to do this, um, well, sometimes I think it's for counting purposes. You know, you count like one, two, three, and you move your elbows with every beat. Uh, but sometimes I think it's just because we're told, well, if you stay in the same position, you will be tense. But when you think about it, if you go about your daily life, you don't really see people doing this, you know, just so they can keep relaxed. I mean, I, I think there's a way that you can relax without having all this extra motion. So while it's okay to have some, I'd say when you have practice sessions, it's good sometimes to just sit down and focus on playing well and being relaxed with as little motion as possible. Uh, for people that are small like me, sometimes it's a bit hard to get up to the fourth key keyboard. It's a bit your, your workout of the day, in fact. Um, so even when you play up there, it's good to remember to keep your shoulders and your elbows and your wrists low, especially your wrists. So you wrist, the, the, the bottom part of your wrist should be more or less even with the keys. Um, so if you move your hand forward, like it should sort of touch. But I feel like very often when we think of playing up there, we, we sort of get into that zombie position with the, or turtle position with the shoulders very high like this. And that's just not good. So even though it's high, remember like keep your upper body as low as possible. Uh, as much as possible, I think your hand should be parallel to the keys. So, you know, if you just play like a scale, right? Um, you shouldn't be turning your hand sideways all the time. It, of course, sometimes you don't have a, a choice. Like if you play a big chord, I don't know, like this. Um, um, you know, you, it might be a little bit easier, you know, if you turn a little bit sideways. Uh, but, but it doesn't help you when you're like always turning with your, with your wrist really going like in a different direction. Um, it's, it's not helpful. It's getting you out of position and then you have to turn again. Uh, you um, should also think of not playing on your nails. So if you hear all that clicking while you're performing, either your nails are too long or you're, you're playing really on the top of your fingers, which is not good. You, you should be playing really on the sort of fleshy part of your fingers. Uh, if you were a cat, you know, that'd be sort of like the, this beautiful little soft uh, paw thing that they have right underneath the claws, right? So really think, I think, if, if you find that you're playing on your nails, again, think about the basketball and stretch your fingers a little bit. It's also going to give you a bigger reach. Very important if you are not uh, very tall. Uh, when you're going, uh, when you're playing, you can just use gravity to pull the keys down. Uh, you know, like on most organ actions, it's not so heavy that you need to put in a lot of weight. The important thing is not to push, you know, and, and be very tense and hold it. Just the weight of your finger usually is, is plenty enough to get the key down, and then you can just relax at the bottom of the key. Uh, if, if you need more weight, you know, you can always use your arm weights. Um, that's, that's usually not a problem, and, and you relax the same way. Your, your fingers are very solid, and you just use more weight, but with your arm completely relaxed. That's the goal, of course. It's not always doable, but as much as, much as possible. When you pass your thumb under, um, 
it's better if you try to not turn your hand or move your elbow. So uh, a good exercise for that would be to just practice. And then when it's time to pass the thumb, just stretch your thumb under. So if I do this slowly, it would look like that. Then I stretch my thumb. And then as soon as I play with my thumb, I'll just sort of swing the rest of my hand on the other side. But I'm not actually doing this type of motion, which means that you can never play quickly and evenly. Like if you do a scale like this, you can actually hear where the, where the thumb is passing, while if you just go stretching under and you go very fast, you can't really um, hear it. So um, you just want to really swing, swing your hand in that direction, reset your hand position as soon as you've moved on to the thumb using it as a pivot. Uh, as much as possible, you should use the stronger fingers of your hand. So your hand is not designed for you to use four and five. I mean, if, if I tell you to go and pick up something, you're not going to pick it up with four and five, you'll use one to three. So these are the fingers that you should use more often, uh, not four and five. And sometimes you'll have passages in say Bach, you know, that are things like, right? And, and I'll, I'll see students come in and they do all of this with three, four, five, which, which is doable, but is a lot more work than if you just did it when one, two, three, for example. You just have a lot more control uh, with these fingers. Um, and, and the same applies to if you do, for example, six, uh, thirds or, or things like that, you know that if you do like, it's a lot easier with one, three, two, four than if you were doing something like, you know, which is quite, quite tricky and, and takes a little bit too much brain power. Uh, if you are playing legato, uh, remember not to shift your entire hands when moving from note to note. So let's say you have this chord, going to this chord, you don't need to be moving all of your hand and sliding down, really you can get the same effect just by moving a couple fingers. Um, and it'd be the same thing for, for you know, smaller things like. Uh, but sometimes I think when we see black keys and then white keys, the default is just to, to go all the way in for the black keys and then like all the way out. Um, but you, your hand should stay in the bottom part of the keyboard as much as possible. Um, not going up and down depending on whether you're playing a white key or a black key. In that way, it's a lot like paddle technique. Like you really want to stay in that sort of same space and not always be moving forward and backwards on the keyboard. Now, all of those uh, technical things uh, go out the window if you're trying to do something like thumbing down. Um, if you were thumbing down and you kept that same type of technique, you would have very limited wingspan, wingspan I think. Like I can barely take an octave, I think, if I do this, right? Um, when doing thumbing down, really your thumb should be vertical as much as possible. And then you should just rest the, the remainder of your hand on the upper keyboard. So like something like that, for example. Um, now, if your thumb was like way down here and, and not vertical, but horizontal as it usually is, you know, there's, it's very difficult to reach and to be accurate. So thumb should really be vertical and should be as much as possible inside the black keys, um, not so much in the bottom part of the of the keyboard. Um, a, a few things to avoid in general, um, call that T with the queen. Those are the people who play with their pinky high up and I'll confess that uh, this happens to me most of the time. Um, so I, I think this happens just because like there's tension that's created in this part of your hand. So one way to work on this is just to have practice sessions where you might do motions like this. And then you know, I'll just focus very intently on keeping my fifth finger resting on the key uh, as, as much as possible. It's, it's really a question, like, if you relax it and think, like, resting on the key, uh, then it's not, it's, not so much of a, it's not so much of a problem. But really, you don't want to play all the time with your finger up here because that creates so much tension in this part of your hand. Uh, another one would be the people who are cat lovers, and those are the people that are petting the keyboard all the time, like, they're sort of scratching. And I know there's some sources that, that say um, this is how Bach played, you know. He, he would like use the weight of his fingers to get the note down and then to release it would not be a vertical upward motion. It would be sort of, he would draw the finger towards him. Uh, but then, then this applies uh, supposedly more to harpsichord playing than to organ playing. And in fact, if you do this on the organ, it's, it's not so bad on EP action but on a tracker, you really do not control the release. So I would suggest not doing this. I, I don't think that's a very good way of playing. And also, um, 
you, there's no way you can play fast if you're doing this. I mean, how, how fast can you do a scale if you're literally pulling each finger towards you? Uh, so again, when you release, I think, just pull the finger back up, or, or even better, let the spring push you out as opposed to drawing towards you. And then the people that must like chicken wings because they're um, constantly moving their elbows like this. And, and again, I, I think that's for relaxation. But really, you don't need to be doing this. I mean, especially if you're playing something. Um, it's not very hard to play, so you don't need to be like one, two, like this. You're just getting out of position again and, and um, not maintaining good contact with the keys. So I think to be avoided uh, as much as possible. Just a few random things about uh, fig uh, fingerings. So we talked about using uh, one, two, three. Uh, if you have things like parallel thirds, very often, if you're able to use one, your thumb that will go underneath instead of using three, for example, you could do this, but you could also go and, and just slide your thumb underneath. It's actually a lot easier than this. Because it's giving a little bit more of a chance to your fourth finger. He's not so stuck between three and five, which is a, a big problem. If you're using the thumb, uh, then the motion is up, down, up, down, as opposed to being both up and down on every other beat. Um, so, so if you can work on that, uh, just, just in general, I think when playing these passages in thirds, for example, if you're playing some Max Reger, you'll probably have a ton of them to play. Uh, sometimes it's good to just go with parallel fingering, even if it's a little bit more bumpy. Um, it, it just makes it easier in the long run. Uh, and, and it's very unlikely anyway that you will have perfect legato for all of those passages. So for example, something like that. It's a lot easier because it's the same motion that's repeated over and over rather than trying to go, you know, maybe like um, with using 3-5 as well. Not really smoother and, and a lot more difficult uh, to control. So um, you could probably do a whole scale with just one, two, one, three, two, four, three, five like this, um, yeah, a lot simpler than um, actually trying to, to keep all of that legato. Now, if you wanted to, tr to keep that legato, I suppose um, you'd have to practice on stretching your third finger above your fourth finger. Again, like still keeping your hand completely parallel and not turning your wrist. So you sort of pull a little bit and then see if you can do it. Um, but in most of that music, it's, it's actually not that helpful to, to do this. Um, so sometimes just the easier fingering uh, go, goes a long way. When putting fingerings in music, that's uh, somewhat related. Always look at phrasing and look at places where you can reset your hand position. And that is really what should determine your fingering a lot more than, um, you know, I've run out of fingers and I need to put something in. Uh, but I find very often people forget to think about the phrasing and the fact that here there's a lift and you can reset your hand position, which completely solves the problem. So maybe, maybe think of those as finding the musical solution to the technical problems. Um, very often it takes care of the problem entirely. Uh, but again, like remember that always use one to three as much as possible. And, and if you have like any sort of scale or anything like that, that you can avoid using four and five, that's always really your best bet. Thanks so much for watching this video. I hope it brought you some helpful tips. Thanks for watching Organist Launchpad.